Hello, everyone. Welcome to EU Open Screen webinar, and thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. This is a webinar organized by EU Open Screen, part of the monthly training events in which we have the pleasure to invite speakers from academia, industry, and other research infrastructures who share their expertise and knowledge for uh, hot scientific topics in chemical biology and early drug discovery. I'm Kathy Skopelitu, the Coordination Manager of Scientific Services in EU Open Screen, and today I'm excited to have here with us Professor Jacek Kolanowski, specialist in the field of biological chemistry and chemical biology, head of the Department of Molecular Probes and Pro Drugs, and director uh, of the Center for High Throughput Screening at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry of the Polish Academy of Science in Poznan. Today, Jacek is going to uh, talk about high throughput and high content fluorescent imaging tools and technologies. I'm sure that many of you uh, know that the simultaneous observation of multiple targets in biological models allows for more comprehensive understanding of the processes and specific capturing of the function of bioactive molecules and their interactions. This in turn allows for more reliable early stage identification of molecular tools and drug candidates and gives insights into their mechanisms of action. In this talk, Jacek will present the work of his group on the design and development of fluorescent and bioluminescent probes and assays for multiparametric uh, screening and high content or ultra super resolution imaging. I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and uh, at the end of the webinar, you can ask your questions directly to your speaker or just type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand to comment and um, uh, you are welcome uh, to um, uh, ask us anything uh, after the end of the webinar. I think it's uh, now time to start. Uh, Jacek, I would like to welcome you once more, and uh, I will give the speech now to you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for this kind introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going now to share my screen. I hope this will work out. We just tried it with Kathy at the moment, and it worked. So. Please let me know if it works. It does yes, work, it, but now I'm not at the right slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly move to the right slide, which is the beginning of my presentation. Great. And I'm going to reshare it again. All right. Thank you, Yats. Yeah, that works fine. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, hello, everyone. And thanks, Kathy, for again, for the invite. Uh, I, I would like to talk to you today a little bit about the uh, both high content and high throughput um, fluorescent imaging tools uh, and techniques, which we uh, kind of work on in my group, and we also explore them in different uh, applications. So just shortly about myself. So I, I, I studied in Poznan chemistry and biotechnology, and then I moved to Bremen for my master's. Then I did my PhD in France. Then I jumped back uh, to Australia, to the other hemisphere for a while. And then I came back to Poznan in 2018 and started my own research group, where I'm currently at. Uh, and this is the Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences. The Institute is called Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry. And actually we are one of the very few institutions in Poland which actually combine chemistry, biology, and informatics in, in one. So we are an independent organization, a research organization. And then uh, we, we are uh, the biggest inst Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, we are also a national leader in acquiring European grants, so we've, uh, and we also are very active in building scientific infrastructure 
uh, in in uh, in medchem and in bi uh, biology, chemistry, and IT. Uh, and actually, there are several different infrastructures uh, which are on the Polish roadmap and also on the European roadmap at our institute. Uh, and I'm the uh, director of one of those, so uh, that's what uh, it is. So I, in fact, w have a kind of like a double hat because I uh, lead a research group, which is a department for molecular probes and prod drugs, but I also kind of help develop the, the Center for High Speed Screening Studies, which is the research infrastructure. And there we focus on hydropod screening, imaging, but also medicinal chemistry. This is our group from the last year summer, so we're looking forward to actually uh, go uh, out uh, soon as well, because weather and pond changed uh, recently, and hopefully it will stay uh, um, sunny and, and nice, so we're looking forward to that. So um, in terms of the topic of what we discuss uh, and the types of tools uh, I, I, I would like to talk about uh, today is the um, the, the tools for, for enabling the high content or multi-dimensional multi-parametric uh, imaging. And in particular, I'd like to talk about so-called the dual anoride probes and also a probes for, uh, which allow us to actually get, uh, image uh, multiple uh, biochemical uh, and, um, and parameters uh, with the resolution, unprecedented resolution of a couple of nanometers. And then I'll also say a few words about the, uh, our center for high throughput screening studies, how we can adapt these tools to the high throughput applications uh, in screening and, and the identification of the bioactive compounds. And uh, in my work, what I do also kind of like uh, additionally is I'm actively involved in the um, Young uh, Scientists uh, Associations uh, where I uh, kind of work on science policy and science advice policy on national and European level. So I wanted to start with already thanking everyone who has been, uh, whose work has been contributing to what I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, and also some funding which we've received for that work, uh, and uh, um, also external collaborations and, and, and so on. And, uh, I will start now talking to you uh, about the actual content of this of this presentation, which I wanted to share with you in particular, and uh, uh, which is in fact the development of the tools for the, for chemical biology applications. As and as most of you probably know, the chemical biology actually is a, a, a study or a, a discipline in which we develop and use chemical compounds to study and modify uh, or alter uh, biological models. And because of this, I often divide these types of tools into those which allow us to see things inside biology uh, and things which allow us to modulate and control biology uh, on, on, on different levels. And our focus is on making the tools to visualize more reliable and also able to see multiple things at the same time and then try to develop tools to modulate, which are more effective and safer in applications. So if we want to look into things uh, in, in biology, uh, we all, of course, can use the uh, imaging, which is a um, approach in which we uh, obtain a uh, spatial temporal information about usually presence, activity, or distribution of different targets. And of course, uh, Imaging in generally is usually uh, considering the structure, structures of, of different biological uh, elements, while molecular imaging aims at molecular targets. So then we can talk about the macromolecules, uh, but also small molecules, ions, and other things like this. And so because there is a plenty of different molecular targets in our um, in, in biological systems. And most of them actually do not generate any um, detectable signal, which allows us to see them uh, and interrogate them externally. We often use a proxies, which are tools, uh, we call them sometimes labels, probes, and, and, uh, and other things, to help and visualize them. So they are kind of like a, a, these markers of the presence or, or activity of those molecular targets. Um, and as I mentioned to you, 
what do you need in order to see those targets is of course a signal, a, a detectable signal which needs to be generated upon interaction with the targets or, or in, in general be present in the, in the system which we investigate in order to be able to, to see it. And you probably are aware these are, I put here uh, three main techniques which are used in, the, uh, on, uh, in imaging uh, applications in biology which is the magnetic resonance imaging, the positron emission tomography and related, so X-ray and other things like this, and the optical uh, imaging. And um, one of the, uh, I will tell you why is that important, but positron emission tomography in general does not allow you to design so-called responsive probes. So responsive probes are more reliable in a way, a way of looking into uh, targets. And so uh, these ones uh, cannot be used for uh, with that application. But magnetic resonance imaging and optical imaging uh, is compatible with the design and development of the tools which uh, can generate signal only upon interaction with the analyte, so so-called the responsive probes. And but each of these uh, techniques uses different type of signal, or uh, which in fact is just a different wavelength of the radiation which we observe. And each of these signals have their own properties and therefore the application of these techniques is more suitable. Uh, 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 some of these are more suitable for different models than the others. And in particular, the MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging, is a, uh, uses the radio waves inside, uh, in fact, to look into the systems inside the bi biological models. And therefore, uh, radio waves are highly penetrable and therefore we can use them for a more complex, bigger, thicker samples. So especially animals, humans, and so on. On the other hand, the optical imaging, of course, is limited by the fact that the light uh, does not penetrate our tissues that well. So it's usually used on more, um, let's say, simpler or thinner samples. Uh, and uh, fluorescence in particular is used especially in the kind of like a cubet like re, uh, research or in cells, while bioluminescence is often used uh, in cellular and also uh, small animal applications. And the particular importance of fluorescence, which I think makes it probably one of the most broadly uh, used, if not most, the most broadly used method uh, of imaging molecular targets, at least in the preclinical uh, set setups, is the fact that it allows us for unmatched uh, cellular resolution, thanks to the uh, uh, precise control of the plates where we excite our samples. It also actually can build upon our extensive over 100 years history uh, of and knowledge of uh, making compounds which are bright and shine, right? So that, uh, that actually uh, allows us to, to uh, use a lot of different structures and we understand quite well structure activity relationship in this type of tools which are to generate fluorescence. And therefore it allows us to create a lot of very useful uh, um, tools. And so uh, now uh, we, we talked about why fluorescence is a, uh, probably a, a one of the, um, methods of choice or the, the types of modalities of choice for molecular imaging. And now a, a few words about the general properties of the probes. So as I mentioned to you before, uh, what we can actually uh, have in principle, uh, we can have a type of tools which keep the same emitting the same signal, but they uh, tell us about the presence of the molecular target by binding selectively to that target. And this would be quite nice, provided that we can wash away the unbound uh, tags or uh, unbound uh, compounds, which if we cannot wash them uh, effectively away, and this is often a case, for example, for intracellular studies, where the uh, compounds which are not bound to the target can still float around, then we have no way of saying whether the, the, this tag has really bound or not bound to the target. Therefore, people uh, preferentially work on uh, development of responsive probes. So something which does not emit a signal or emits a signal of one type and then changes the signal it emits upon binding to the target or interacting with the target. And so this type of response, which we can 
have uh, in, uh, in presence of the target can be a so-called a turn-off response or a turn-on response. Turn-off means the signal disappears, turn-off turn means signal disappears, turn-on, of course, means signal appears. The problem with turn-off, of course, is that if we don't see a signal, then it might be because indeed our target turned off the signal or it is just because something happened to our probe or maybe some, our equipment or whatever. So it is not very reliable to, uh, to have this turn off type of response. If we have a turn on response, at least when we have a signal, we can say, well, uh, the, the compound's present, probably the, the, the target is present. The, the, uh, the problem is though, that it is very difficult to develop tools which are truly turn on. What does it mean? It's like the tools which are truly, truly completely non-fluorescent uh, on emitting no signal initially, and then emitting some signal after interaction. Usually uh, in almost all cases, what we really have, we have some basal fluorescence, so basal signal before interaction with the target, and then increasing that signal after interaction. What does it uh, cause? So you can see here on that picture, I showed you a something without the probe inside, something before activation and after activation by the target. But you can imagine that, especially in the cellular environment, we have no ways of controlling how much of our probe is in particular place in the cell. And the only way we can conclude on that is looking into the intensity of fluorescence coming out of it. But if we have an increased intensity of fluorescence, then it might come from the fact that indeed our compound, our probe has been activated by the target and therefore we have a higher intensity, or it is simply an accumulation of this uh, state with a lower intensity before activation. So there is no way of distinguishing between the two. And therefore, sometimes it is very difficult to judge, to interpret the results just relying on intensity of fluorescence because as I said, it can depend on the concentration of the probe and not only the concentration of the analyte we want to detect. So uh, it is very important if we want to be reliable about uh, the way we interpret the results uh, to develop tools which uh, do not suffer from that problem. And those tools in fluorescent settings uh, can uh, use one of, usually one of the two approaches. So. Uh, Either the ratio, we can measure the ratio of intensities at, di at different wavelengths, or we can measure fluorescence lifetimes. Though those two parameters will be independent on the concentration of the probe, and they are dependent only on the presence of the analyte we detect or not. In particular, with the ratios of intensities, uh, what we say is that the probe initially is of one color or has the higher intensity in one wavelength versus the others, and then it changes the ratio between the two intensities upon binding to the analyte. So this is really critical to kind of like uh, keep in mind that the, these two types of things, so ratio metric response, we call it. So ratios of intensities in different colors or fluorescence lifetime are two parameters which are independent on the uh, amount of probe in the given place and only depend on the environment and the target. And as such, they are more reliable uh, tools uh, for interpretation of the, of the results. And so I just wanted initially to give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, so we've worked on that a lot to develop this more reliable fluorescent tools um, uh, already during my postdoc, but also after I came back to Poland. And one of the examples here, which I wanted to share with you is this, uh, these probes uh, uh, or the, the, the way we approach the problem of trying to look into the mechanism of uh, uh, elucidating a mechanism uh, of uh, pathologic, uh, pathological mechanism of the uh, respiratory sensitivity of virus infection of human cells. And uh, our partners from the University of Melbourne uh, looked, uh, worked on that uh, problem and they wanted to look into the mitochondrial um, changes in the mitochondrial oxidative stress caused by the, uh, the synthetial virus. But the problem is that uh, this virus uh, could have changed the, um, the um, potential, membrane potential of the mitochondria, which usually affects the concentration of the uh, commercially available probes, which you can use for studying the ROS in mitochondria. 
So what we did, we looked into uh, different tools and, we, and one of the tools developed in the group I've worked uh, before was called the FRR2 probe, which is in fact a ratio metric probe, a probe which emits the red and green colors. And the green color is dependent on, on, on the, let's say on, on, on the uh, redox activity, but the red color is less so. And so uh, what we've done then, uh, what is also important, this probe localizes in the mitochondria thanks to this cut ionic lipophilic nature. Uh, but also what it does is that this ratio between uh, uh, the two different fluorescences, uh, the, the two different fluorescences, in fact, is independent on the concentration of the probe. So if we have a situation in which we have uh, affected a mitochondrial membrane potential of our target, then uh, there will be less probe localizing in there, but we will still uh, be able to study in mitochondria the, the redox potential or the redox state inside because of the fact that independently on the concentration of the probe, the ratio is just dependent on the ROS activity. And indeed, these pictures here show you that the, 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 the mm, system treated with rotenone uh, shows you uh, an increased uh, ratio of uh, fluorescences excited in different wavelengths, uh, which is pretty much the same to where we treat uh, our cells with, the, um, with our uh, syncytial virus. Uh, on the other hand, the MITO-Q, so this is a, um, uh, one of the inhibitors of the, of the redox generation in mitochondria, can actually stop that, uh, so uh, counteract that increase in the reactive oxygen species generation in mitochondria. Uh, similarly, uh, both in the presence of the virus and without it. So really what we've shown is that by selecting the right tool, the ratio metric tool, we were able to actually reliably study the uh, ROS in the mitochondria, which has been changing the uh, potential. Another uh, example uh, now by the, of the use of the lifetime imaging. So this parameter, which is not intensity of fluorescence, but the fluorescence lifetime. We have shown that uh, the, uh, what we did here is we uh, kind of uh, wanted to study the dual uh, nature of the flavin compounds. Flavin compounds are the compounds which you know from FAD, for example, cofactors, and they can both usually, uh, they change, they are redox active and they change their fluorescence in the presence or absence, uh, whether in the reduced form or the oxidized form, but they also can generate reactive oxygen species and, uh, uh, and activate single oxygen. So what we did here, we studied uh, the system, uh, not just by the intensity of the fluorescence, which is very uh, variable. Uh, and uh, we cannot distinguish uh, the change in the intensity of fluorescence uh, uh, between the out of fluorescence of the cells caused by potentially flavins or the intrinsic fluorescence of the flavin themselves. But if we take into, if we study the lifetime, and we uh, study the changes in the lifetime, then we can assign the responses, uh, even if they are at the same wavelengths and intensities, separately to our probe and to intrinsic uh, out of fluorescence of the cells. And this is really what we've done here. So we showed you that addition of the, our compound we also studied two channels, uh, which allowed us to look into it even with more details. And addition of the compounds to, to cells increases the uh, longer wavelength lifetimes, similarly to TB, but the wave of lifetime uh, with the addition of the oxidative stressor here, TB is an oxidative stressor, uh, is smaller. And then when we mix both, so we have an oxidative stressor and our compound, we pretty much see the response similar to just the oxidative stressor. That means that the uh, activity of our compound is kind of overwhelmed by the activity of the oxidative stressor here in these cells. So really this shows you that the FLIM technique allows you to evaluate compounds um, to separate between the, and more reliably evaluate both the intrinsic property of the probe in pot potentially, but also the out of fluorescence changes caused potentially by our account.
So we've also worked before on multiple probes, and you can just see here some examples for the metal ions, redox state, lipase, and therapeutic metal ions. And we've published a series of papers on that before. But uh, in the recent years, we wanted to focus on not looking into single analyte at the same, but looking into interactions between the analytes. And so uh, why do we do that? Of course, uh, as uh, Kathy has already mentioned at the beginning of, our, of my talk, uh, the, um, the, the complexity, the biological complexity really requires us to be able to visualize multiple things at the same time. Because if we just observe a single element, uh, then of course, uh, just seeing that element or, or studying its activity does not really tell us about the whole, uh, the, the whole process because uh, this activity might, or presence of this analyte might mean something else depending on its molecular context. So we want to study the molecular context as well uh, at the same time. So, uh, and you know, for biological systems, of course, it is, we all know how complex they are, how dense they are uh, with different analytes, but also, uh, you know, it is not e enough to know just the analyte themselves, but also when this analyte has appeared and is it together with other analytes and where in the cells. So this whole complexity, we thought that well, uh, we can partially try to solve that in, at least by trying to develop tools which allow you to look into two analytes at the same time with a single molecule. Uh, so normally, of course, we, you could use two molecules, uh, each of different analytes, but the problem is that each of these molecules, each of these probes, which would detect different analytes at the same time, would behave differently in the cells, would have a different concentrations, distributions, and usually will not be physically exactly in the same place, even if it seems so on the image. With the single molecule, which uh, is there to detect presence of two analytes at the same time, we can actually uh, have that uh, relationship between the two analytes of passive analytes being studied in a more reliable way. So uh, we have proposed that, and uh, when we proposed that initially, there was only few examples of such probes. Uh, when we kind of like put the, uh, together the concept and, and published it, and now uh, within the last few years. Uh, tens and dozens of those compounds have been uh, published uh, as well. So more and more people are studying those. Uh, and uh, our work in that uh, aspect focuses uh, on a kind of proof of concept where we would like to uh, demonstrate the relationship between the redox state control uh, elements and the essential metal ions and their relationship between each other and the pairs uh, because they all affect each other and both metal ions and the redox state, they uh, are underpinning a lot of uh, um, toxic and pathological processes, but their relationship is not very well understood. And we hope by, that by doing that and uh, figuring out the true relationships between uh, those elements, we will be able to more reliably say what relationship has to be there to predict that the disease will develop badly or that disease can be cured and so on. And so what we've done, what we do in that aspect, we work on both the fluorescent probes, dual analyte ones and the bioluminescent one. But today I will focus mainly on the fluorescent probes. And we do that on the model of the prostate cancer. So uh, an example of the probes we developed for that is a, is a probe uh, uh, and, and the target we wanted to look at is the hypoxia. And hypoxia, we all know, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one of the main kind of characteristics of the tumor, uh, tumors, uh, solid tumors. And it is a consequence of the rapid growth of the tumor and insufficient vascularization growth at the same time. But interestingly, uh, actually, the hypoxic regions have been shown on multiple occasions that they are uh, often places where we have cells which are highly resistant to the therapy and uh, also uh, of the metastatic potential. So if we want to look into hypoxia, we should actually figure out what are the particular parameters which characterize hypoxia, biochemical parameters, and then we try to visualize them. And the two parameters which are known to, to do that, or are known to be different in hypoxic regions versus normal cells, is the nitroreductase-like activity and the high acidity. Uh, both are caused by the low oxygen level and also a low clearance of the metabolites, which leads to the acidification. Of course, 
low, uh, uh, as, uh, low pH, so high acidity, is also present in many other uh, places. And higher reductive uh, uh, reducing potential is also present in other conditions. But the combination of the two is characteristic for hypoxia. So looking into both parameters at the same time will more reliably allow us to look at truly hypoxic regions. So the groups which can tell you, and um, which are often used to, to identify pH is of course the groups which are uh, pH active or, or um, acid, are in the acid base equilibria and uh, nitro, um, um, nitrous oxides are the groups which are used often to study nitro reductase activities. So we've designed a probe where we have a chlorophore and to it we have a, a a group, uh, a, a, a protecting group attached, which is responsive to NTR. And once the NTR cleaves off that group, then it shows us or uh, exposes a pH responsive group. And the protonation of that group leads to increase in fluorescence. And the protonation leads to the changes in the structure of that uh, fluorophore and leads to lack of fluorescence. So we can kind of like, it's a pH sensor, but activated by the NTR. So both of those low pH and high NTR activity have to be present for the signal to appear. And we showed that it works in the buffer, uh, but, the prob uh, but the problem is that it is just intensity-based response. This mean, and we tried to use it in cells and our um, um, responses were inconclusive. So what we've done, we've of course turned into an old trick of, try of attaching a another fluorophore to our probe, which is uh, non-reactive and independent on this target. And so now we have a blue fluorophore, which doesn't change the intensity of its fluorescence of a little. And then we have a orange fluorophore, which is responsive. And so now we have really what we can measure, as you can see here on the graph on the left-hand side, you can measure a change in the ratio of the blue signal to the orange signal. And this change, is only uh, like is most visible when both analyzed. So uh, NTR activity and low pH are happening. So this allows us for a more reliable looking into the signal. And indeed, uh, we've done these experiments in cells. And we've, we've uh, um, firstly looked into the probe in cells and we showed that in hypoxia, there is in, indeed a change in the ratio of the signals in different wavelengths. But also we showed that, uh, uh, so this confirms kind of our response, but one important aspect is also that we looked into the uh, localization of our probe. Because uh, lysosomes are naturally acidic environments, so we could have a false positive signal if our compound localized specifically in, my, in uh, lysosomes. But we showed that it is not happening really neither in normoxia nor in hypoxia. So now we also proven that the ratio of, uh, of fluorescence in uh, orange and, and blue uh, is actually increasing in the uh, uh, hypoxic regions versus anormoxic ones. So we have a reliable way now of looking into the hypoxic regions. We've also developed on the same basis another uh, fluorophore uh, where, so again, the dual analyte fluorescent probe, but this time not for pH and NTR, which are proxies for hypoxia, but now for the two targets, which are uh, involved in the process of a TMPR SS2 and ACE2, which are involved in the process of the entry of SARS-CoV-2 into the, and other retroviruses uh, into the uh, host's human cells. So we designed a probe, which actually needs to be activated by both uh, proteins in order to generate a signal. And you can see here actually that we have a, a here we have a response when we add first enzyme, we have a drop in the in signal in one wavelength. And when we add both enzymes together, then we have an increase in that uh, signal intensity. So the ratio between the two is different when both enzymes are active versus when the only one enzyme is active. So again, this can be reliably used. We have miniaturized the assay, confirmed its response to cell, and now we are developing a Hydrophobic screening assay on the basis of that. So we've also done some work on the bioluminescent probe. So we confirmed the same kind of um, uh, uh, possibility of designing dual analyte responsive probes, uh, but uh, for the bioluminescence. But I don't want to talk too much about it today. I just want to tell you that we showed that it can is possible for two enzymatic activities involved in the um, 
we do some myostasis like NTR and uh, gamma glutamate transferase. Um, so this is about this approach of dual analyzed probe. So single probe, which can detect two analytes at the same time. That's one way of kind of like uh, approaching the high content, so multi-parametric imaging uh, aspect. But another work we are doing is also on trying and looking into designing tools to study things at the uh, unmet, uh, previously unprecedented resolution. So you are probably all aware uh, roughly of the sizes of different organelle and elements of the cells. And I put here the pictures, which are the real uh, to scale kind of like pictures of the sizes of different uh, biological uh, systems uh, and also pixels of different techniques which can be used to study those systems. So confocal microscopy, which is most commonly used for that, uh, has 0 0.5 micrometer resolution uh, roughly. The super resolution techniques which uh, have been uh, given the uh, which have been awarded a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 2014. They allow you to look uh, with the resolution of 20 to 50 nanometer. So here the blue and the red are the example pixels of the techniques and the corresponding two scale sizes of different potential targets. So membranes of the cells or proteins of the cells. And you can actually now uh, think about this that if we have, let's say a pixel of five, 500 uh, uh, nanometers. And uh, we talk about the colocalization of the two targets, for example. So we start, we have a probe A and probe B studying each of different targets. One is colored red, one is colored green. And then we see that both of them are present in the pixel of the size of 500 nanometers, so in confocal microscopy. And we then say they are colocalized. But that is really not true. It's a little bit like saying, I went to the stadium for a game, you went to the stadium for a game, and that means that we've met at the stadium. That's not true, right? Because the stadium is way bigger than, uh, than, than uh, us. And so just saying that we are at the stadium is not enough to say that we met. So that's why we want to go lower and lower with the resolution to make sure that what we see is truly the presence next to each other of the two targets. And this is particularly possible with this new technique, uh, uh, which is called MinFlux technique. Uh, it's a, a micro, we have uh, been one of the few first places uh, in the world to acquire that uh, microscopy. And we are, and this technique allows you to actually look at molecular targets with the even one, two nanometer resolution. So literally it is the pixel of that technique can be smaller than the size of the protein and pretty much the size of the single small molecule. So that uh, approach really allows you to study things exactly where they are. And so what we try to do is we try to do, develop tools to, to, for that technique uh, and for super resolution uh, microscopy. And you've probably heard of, um, and one of the ways of doing that is to tag the proteins in some way by the fluorescent compounds. And you can do that by having GFP co-expressed with your uh, target. You can also uh, replace GFP with uh, other tags like SnapTag or Halo tag, which uh, are not fluorescent themselves. But when you feed cells with the specific substrate for that tags, then the tag only goes and binds to the to the target. What we want to uh, and we work on that tools here, but we want to design them in a way that they are not fluorescent initially, and when they bind, they become fluorescent, so that we don't ha have a problem of washing away the, the, the resi resi residual one. But we also work on developing a genetic free uh, and traceless tagging of the targets. So then what you do is you have a tool, a probe, which is uh, composed of the some ligand of the uh, protein, reversible non-covalent ligand on the protein and a potential flu probe. When it goes into cells, it uh, interacts with this target, binds to it, and then reacts with the surface of the target. This allows us to actually introduce a tool or the fluorophore or tag or whatever else on the surface of the protein without altering its activity and without genetic modification. So uh, this is what we've uh, uh, exactly trying to do. So we, we, we have uh, tried to do that also to study not only the presence of the analytes, but also the, the presence of our target proteins, but also to study the changes in the environment around them. So if we now turn that probe, which is in green here, into something which can also detect, for example, pH or something else, then we can start to study locally 
at the surface of the protein, changes in pH or other parameters. So uh, this technique of labeling of the protein, uh, I'm sure many of you can see uh, that also very quickly and are aware of that, but that if we have an endogenous way of attaching covalent things to the protein, we can extend that not only to imaging, but we could also extend that to some uh, uh, target identification technology if we replace the fluorophore by the biotin and or if we replace the fluorophore by the reversible uh, um, inhibitor, then we can create a, a covalent version of that inhibitor, which will have a higher selectivity and higher reactivity. So now I wanted to show you a kind of technologies and our infrastructure, which we use and adapt these tools I talked to you about to study and identify the bioactive molecules. So this is done in the center of high throughput screening studies or uh, for chemical biology, as we now call it. And it is a certified partner side of the EU Open Screen. And what we try to do there is we try to provide a, a and uh, provide the expertise in high throughput screening, but also in other techniques, but also develop new technologies to improve reliability of identification of the targets uh, of uh, sorry of the of the bioactive molecules. Uh, I will not talk too much about that because you've all heard about this already, but uh, eOpen Screen, of course, has 33 partners in 10 countries. It's de still developing and has both sc uh, all screening, medchem, and now soon chemoproteomic capacities, and also provides uh, uh, libraries of compounds which can be used in screenings. In our center, we have a set of different um, um, equipment, uh, which is uh, well known for people who are uh, in the topic. So we have a lot of different liquid handling systems which allow us to add different quantities with different speed, uh, which is important for doing complex assays and protocols. We for the detection, we have a plate readers which allow us to look uh, at fluorescence, bioluminescence and derivatives, but also covalent uh, um, confocal microscope, which allows us to look into images. We also have other labs uh, in the background and we have a, uh, um, robotic system, automated uh, uh, robotic system, which kind of coordinates the work of, the, of these things. And so how do our tools can fit into the process of development of tool compounds, uh, so probes or uh, drug candidates? So we position ourselves kind of like uh, in this early stages where, uh, so in this, where the first step of that early stage would be screening. So we have a library, we, have, we need a model, and we need an assay. So something which will tell us whether compounds from the library act on the model. And these assays can be built on the tools which we develop, dual analyte tools, but also other things. And especially that we try to develop a multi-parametric assays to do that. Then you have a hit and then you have a validation process. And again, in there you can use other more complex assays, but also technologies like super resolution microscopy to confirm the mechanisms of action. And we also kind of now do uh, synthetic chemistry work uh, and uh, biosynthesis to create uh, uh, derivatives of leads and dedicated libraries and then test them as well. So one of the examples of, of uh, maybe, I didn't want to show you that the regular things and usual tests which people do at high throughput screening. So I decided to choose a couple of uh, more uh, unusual ones maybe. So we have uh, developed and adapted an indicator to displacement assay to study the binders, not, on, not of the proteins, but of the specific 3D structures of the RNA uh, uh, molecules. And especially because RNA is becoming more and more of interest as a target for drug development, these particular approaches uh, seem to be quite interesting, especially if we could, for example, have uh, a, an assay which would allow us to see binding to different structures with different colors. So we've uh, confirmed that uh, by screening uh, for the binders of flu and SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNAs. We also work on development of the adaptation of the cell painting assays, which many of you are aware of, which is focused on uh, or, or which is based on uh, visualizing multiple elements of the structural elements of the cell and then uh, treating those cells uh, with uh, variable compounds, some of them with known act mechanism of action and some of them with unknown. And then on the basis of the type of the staining pattern, which is caused by those compounds, we can compare which staining patterns are similar to each other, which ones are not, and then 
conclude or maybe get ideas about the potential mechanisms of actions of those unknown compounds if they are matching the staining pattern caused by compounds with known mechanisms. But we can also use this. So this is how we do that in, in, in fact. So uh, uh, you can do just some chemical perturbation. This is taken just from the, from the uh, paper, original paper. You have the uh, experiments in the multiple plate. Then you have a lot of images, thousands if not uh, millions of images, depending on the scale of what you do. And then you need an image analysis approaches and then the data analysis uh, out of this. And for that, we use uh, both the established techniques, which are based on trying to get uh, a lot of numbers characterizing uh, the intensity, size uh, of uh, different uh, areas and uh, distribution, and then uh, use uh, approaches to kind of cluster the images uh, based on these numbers. But we also work on the neural, uh, neuronal network uh, approaches where we uh, kind of com try to compare the images directly between each other, cluster them. And we do that in the collaboration with the industrial partners. So uh, in our services on the screening level, uh, we do all of this uh, standard kind of like assay development, high throughput screening. We also uh, really focus on development of screening technology. So we look for the new screening technologies, especially the ones which allow us to use multiple uh, modalities of detection together to have these multiple assays. And we work on development of these multiple assays. Uh, so we are operational uh, truly since 2021. And uh, since that time, we've been managing budgets uh, uh, in infrastructure budget of over 10 million euros and uh, recruited uh, uh, our own budget in, uh, of our task of over 4 million euros. Uh, the way you can work with us, so we uh, do work together with commercial and academic partners through a preferentially scientific collaboration, which is based on the cost uh, uh, only a model where the user uh, only uh, covers the costs of our work, and then we share IP and results together. But we can also provide purely uh, services. The price, of course, depends on multiple uh, elements of that, and uh, we uh, also help often uh, our users in kind of finding the potential sources of, of funding for their research, uh, which will be partially done at our institutes. And we've been involved in uh, now over 40 projects, professional over 40 projects with a success rate of over 70%. Uh, so this is just a, a summary of some of the uh, things which we kind of offer. So I told you uh, we, ha we have the high throughput screening platform. A part of this is also medicinal chemistry, which is very important. We are now developing it as well where we can uh, optimize the, the tools, but we also are able to actually um, synthesize especially complex uh, compounds which cannot be synthesized with classic synthetic methods. We have a super resolution nanoscopy approaches and we also uh, work on the high content uh, platforms. So that will be it. Thank you so much for your attention and I will be very happy to take any questions. Many thanks, Jacek, for the great presentation and the nice and clear examples you, you showed to us. Um, okay, let's uh, start with the first question uh, from our participants, uh, which says, genetically modified bioluminescent pathogens have been designed and monitored both in vivo and in vitro in the presence and absence of therapies to test their effectiveness. Uh, how do you see specifically the future of fungi for these purposes? The fu fungi as a, uh, so maybe I would like to ask the fungi as a uh, potentially uh, a, a pathogen? Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I mean, the, uh, we have done this and uh, you are right here. This is quite a common uh, approach for viruses, for example. So we've done that work before here also at the Institute uh, where we had the virals, which was, uh, flores uh, which was late, not uh, dangerous, but it was uh, bioluminescently latent uh, active. And then we could study the uh, entering the, the cells or by the virus and blocking that enter. 
And of course, the modification of, of fun, fungi uh, and creating bioluminescent fungi is also possible. We have to just remember that some fungi have an intrinsic bioluminescent, uh, bioluminescent systems in them. So if we do that, and uh, in, so we could even do, uh, use the intrinsic endogenous systems to kind of study how they behave. Very commonly, it is done uh, even without the need of putting bioluminescent systems inside the fungi, but rather using a typical stains for the uh, cell wall of the fungi, because they are very specific. So of course, you could go uh, about trying to modify fungi for the purpose and in introduction of the bioluminescent systems in them as we do it with viruses, but it is more complex because the system is more complex. And also, and, uh, uh, but you could also use other techniques to uh, visualize fungi instead of artificially developing uh, uh, the, the bioluminescent system. So like the staining of the specific uh, elements of the fungi, which are not present, for example, in our cells, right? Like the cell wall. Hmm? Yeah. Great, thanks, Jacek. Um, another question about bioluminescence imaging. Um, bioluminescence imaging has found limited use in the imaging of plant metabolites, proteins, and physiology. Can you please comment on this? Yeah, so uh, plants are generally a, a challenging, <laughs> a challenging uh, target for, or challenging model for optical imaging, whether it is a fluorescence or the bioluminescence because of its intrinsic high out of fluorescence, that's one thing, and B, because of the difficulty, of course, in, uh, with the cell wall, uh, uh, which uh, also uh, affects the uh, penetrability, if you wish, of the targets or substrates uh, or, or, or of the plants. So um, I cannot really tell much about the difficulties in genetic modifications of the plants. I, I'm not an expert in that. So you would have to ask uh, other people if this is uh, how challenging that is on the level, but definitely the challenge stems from the ba high background signals. For bioluminescence, they shouldn't be there, uh, less so. But also, you know, for bioluminescence, what you need, you still need to feed plants with the substrate for the luciferase, which you artificially introduce in and penetrability, of course, and then uh, it, it, it will be a, a challenge as well in distribution inside the plants, so. Exactly. Um, thanks, Jacek, for this uh, reply. I can see a raised hand from Aurora, so I will give the speech now to her. Uh, she may ask her question to you. Sure. Aurora? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you fine. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very, very nice presentation. I learned a lot. I just uh, wonder about the probe that you were mentioning for distinguishing between iron-3 and iron-2. Uh, I, I have seen some uh, probes. Uh, some of them are uh, commercially available. Uh, which is the, the, could you please provide the reference for that? Or do you want, um, or, or do you know, uh, uh, if it is commercially available, some of some of the good ones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Aurora, thanks for raising this topic. I specifically uh, I didn't show uh, in details the iron probes, uh, which we work on very inten intensively, simply because uh, all iron probes have disadvantages really, which are which exist at the moment. And iron is probably one of the most challenging targets to look into because of what you've mentioned. So they, they are, uh, it's, it's uh, ability to turn between iron three, iron two. On the top of that, in that process, often there is a generation of reactive oxygen species. There is also a certain elusiveness in iron uh, because it is uh, quite tightly controlled by our cells uh, due to its potential phantom like so uh, ROS generation activity and therefore iron is often bound tightly in the proteins and only some of it is labeled uh, bound by the labile uh, ligands inside the cells and it is difficult to detect it to compete effectively for this iron between the probe and the endogenous ligands of the iron so i i can say that there are a few which have been published uh, uh, and before the, the Ronox series of probes, which is based on the N, uh, like a, a night, um, uh, N oxide uh, yeah. motives, uh, which, uh, which are there 
Um, we have tried to work with them a little bit in our hands. We had some challenges associated with that, but I know that other people with the commercial ones have, have done it quite a nice work with it. So uh, that's one of the things. The other one is now, I forgot the name, but uh, there are the, uh, mm, the, the probes developed by Chris Chang based on this uh, highly kind of like a, a, a kind of uh, dioxane, dioxetane like uh, structures, which are cleaved by iron too. And those probes seem, we, I didn't work with them uh, particular myself, but uh, from what I read about them, they seem to be also very powerful way because also they now design the ratiometric versions of them. We've developed a probe ourselves as well, which is called uh, um, the, uh, um, I, I now even forgot because we've created a lot of <laughs> on that one, but there is a work, uh, so work we've uh, published myself and Liz New uh, for, with that probe, which, which uh, we found quite useful, but it's dynamic range is limited. So we had a challenge with that as well. So for some concentrations of iron, it was fine, but for others, it wasn't. So it really depends on the, your application. And to be honest, every for every model you have, I think you should test different ones and see how they work. Because I am honest with you, this is out of all the targets I've been working on, this is by far the most challenging one. And I don't know any of the problems which wouldn't have their own problems. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I saw once that some that they were they had the phenantrolin stuff off also, but so, um, yeah, that, that one is also uh, that, but it has also its own challenges in terms of uh, rec rec re requirement of the oxygen for uh, so for cleaving some of these things, and then there is a self generation of reactive oxygen species in the process, which disturbs the system, so that they are. It is every every probe has its own problem. So really, yeah. uh, you have to really get into details of each of them and really read the papers exactly, not only for what is in the papers, but also for what is not in the papers and what has <laughs> not been tested uh, to see whether it was really truly kind of like selective and truly confirmed for activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you Aurora, for your uh, question. Uh, another one, which is more uh, a general one, which are the limitations of bioluminescent systems? Uh, so I've, uh, I see that many of you are interested in the bioluminescent systems. I have focused today on the fluorescent from the particular reason that the uh, fluorescence allows you for this uh, unprecedented, so the resolution which cannot be attained by the bioluminescence. And I think for molecular, imaging if we talk about the imaging so the spatial information about the distribution of the targets bioluminescence is not the best tool to to look at however however bioluminescence definitely has an advantage of the high sensitivity the one reason is that it pr principally has no background in terms of signal we don't have intrinsic bioluminescent systems inside human cells and therefore, if we introduce it uh, in it, a single photon out, which we detect in the from the bioluminescence, is actually, uh, we can uh, reliably attribute to our probe. So that means that uh, the background is pretty much zero in that regard. So that is a huge power of bioluminescence. This makes it uh, sen very sensitive. We can also direct, uh, by using bioluminescence, this advantage and disadvantage. We can genetically target the proteins which we want, so we don't have that problem. That we, uh, yeah. if I mean, uh, of course, if you use the small molecules uh, to detect other things, this is a, a not. But what you can do, you can also put a tag, bioluminescent tag on the on your target, and if you do that, then of course you know that the signal which you get is from the target. The problem is you don't know where the target is because the bioluminescence resolutions are millimeters. So they are not uh, very precise at all. Uh, so so that's, that's very difficult. Uh, disadvantage of that thing is though that you have to genetically modify the system if you want to, to use that. So you have to have cells which express either constitutively and alone luciferase, and then you treat as a, a blocked substrates uh, to it, which are cleaved off, for example, by your analytes, and then they react with the enzyme, which is already there, the luciferase, wherever they are cleaved off. 
or uh, but uh, you have to introduce that gen uh, genetically into the system. This is of course a challenge and people are now trying to move to hemiluminescence. Hemiluminescence is we have a reaction which doesn't require an enzyme in yeah. there, which generates the signal out without excitation. So that's of course uh, very useful, but any systems uh, based on hemiluminescence also, and uh, they of often kind of require multi-step reactions. So this is another challenge to have a quantification and have a calibration curves and things like this done for the bioluminescent or hemiluminescent responses due to the cascade of reactions which need to happen for you to actually correlate the signal with the target. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jacek. Um, I think we have uh, um, time for one more uh, question. Finally, for uh, fluorescence imaging, uh, what will be the opportunities and also the challenges by combining fluorescence imaging and spectroscopic tools with each other and with others, such as atomic force and cryo-electron microscopy? So, uh... Thank you for that question, whoever asked it. This is something which uh, uh, excites me as well. So I have to say that this is, I think, a very, very interesting uh, topic to talk about. Uh, I truly believe in a, a multi-modality uh, of detection and multi-modality of approaches. So having combination of different types of signal. In fluorescence, we can ha have a different types of signal, but we can have atomic force, different fluorescence and other things together. Of course, uh, I think that this, this complementarity of the techniques, uh, what they can give you, provided that you can carry out those two things on exactly the same biological model, it will completely change the way we look at things and we get it, right? Yeah. At the moment, what we do, we do separately cryo, separately fluorescence often, and then we kind of try to get the information about it uh, by statistical means. But if you can have the same molecule, the same element, which you look at both by cryo, both by fluorescence, Combining both by other all spectroscopy, the, yeah. but only on the same molecule, then you know everything about that molecule. The challenge there is, and I have to say, there are not only hardware challenges, which we are now uh, um, getting better with. There are challenges in terms of using tools and tags which fit that application, so designing them right, but also sensitivities of these techniques are often, they are often in very different ranges. And so you have to be really careful to uh, adapt, to use techniques which have the same kind of level of sensitivity because then uh, otherwise you can't talk about this. And another thing is one technique can uh, create artifacts in the other technique. So that's also another thing which you need to always take into consideration. It's a very complex research, very interesting though, a lot of uh, place for still development and, and doing work also for the younger people, if you guys think of what to do, I think this multimodality combination of different spectroscopic and other techniques together is a great area to look into. For sure, for sure. At this point, Jacek, I would like to thank you again for uh, for the great talk and the very nice discussion we had uh, about this topic. I'm sure that we will have the opportunity in the near future to discuss more about it because it's a challenging field and exciting. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank, thank you to you, Kathy. Thank you to all of you who listen and all of you who ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, at this point, uh, I would like uh, to remind you that um, uh, you can find us uh, in our uh, website uh, in uh, www.eupenscreen.eu or you can contact, uh, contact us uh, for any questions and inquiries regarding training uh, at uh, uh, our email address. Of course, you can uh, learn more about training activities uh, through our website and our uh, training tab. And you can uh, subscribe also to uh, our newsletter and receive news uh, and regular updates about EU Open Screen. Uh, I would like to thank you once again uh, for being here with us today, and I hope to hear to see you um, soon in our future training activities. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Bye.